Hello and welcome to the Monopath podcast. So today I am speaking with my friend Jess, who has a little Instagram business that really only started in the last couple of months. Jess Bakes Vegan. So Jess, as the name implies, bakes vegan cakes, cookies, cupcakes, all these sorts of things. Jess is great. We've known each other a few years now. And the conversation really goes through the sorts of things you might expect just from Jess's business name. So we do talk about veganism and the utility of it, uh, its relationship to ethics, particularly focusing on animal cruelty and touching on some other things loosely connected to that. We talk about veganism in food as well and the kind of sideways approach and the solutions to the previous, previously mentioned problems that it solves. That's kind of something to do with what alternatives are used in vegan baking. So it's quite interesting in that regard because, I mean, I'm not a baker. I have not really got a clue. I can cook, but not much of a baker. So these things are just intrinsically interesting to me anyway. I kind of like this feeling of being caught off guard and surprised by information I wouldn't have found otherwise. Other than those things, we speak about baking. Again, as the name does suggest. Although I think the real pleasant surprise of this podcast was that we spent quite a lot of time talking about happiness and well-being and the role of work and meaning and whether you can get it from the job that you do. I think for most people, the answer to that question is fairly obvious, but we take it in a bit more detail in any case. This was a great conversation. It's nice to formally catch up with somebody who I do not often get the chance to, as is the case with most of these conversations on the podcast at this point. Okay, before I hand you over to Jess, I'll just state the usual things. and um, Maybe I should record some introduction that is just the same so I can stop saying the same things every week. I kind of never like hearing that on podcasts. It sounds a bit dull and I switch off. But if you want to support the podcast, you can leave a review on iTunes. That really does help. Um, it helps to encourage guests, and especially when it's people I don't already have a relationship with. It does help to encourage them and know that the podcast will not be a waste of their time, which hopefully it isn't. Other than that, you can buy some tea from Arthur Dove Tea Co. That's not just money in my pocket. That is just paying the bills at the moment, frankly. I'm furloughed. I'm a furloughed employee, so it means I'm trying to do things creatively that can fill the gap in my wage packet. And speaking of which, that's really how this conversation begins about wages, money, uh, scarcity mindset, and we conclude around about the same point. So I'll not say anything else. Instead, I will introduce you to Jess Bakes Vegan. Jess, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. (laughs) See, nice and easy. So we've just been having a conversation before this about how unusual it is at the beginning of a podcast when you've been having a pleasant, normal conversation with another human being to break off and to listen to me uh, fulfill my obligations as a host. They are a bit odd. I still say this. I mean, I'm 20 podcasts in, I think now, and it is still a bit weird at the start because most of the people I speak with, the people that I've met or know already. So there's a big preamble before we even dive into the conversation that's meant to be about creativity it's just here we are like i've already said hi to you once how many <laughs> how many yeah, highs does a man need <laughs> uh all of the highs all of the highs none of the lows please so it might just be worth beginning by you letting everybody know what you do creatively at the moment i mean i'll help along there i mean we, you are you are baking, and that was the main reason that I wanted to speak to you. I'm sure there's plenty of other ways to go with it, because I know you have a background in fashion mm-hmm. as well. So it'd be nice to touch on all of those things, but what are you doing 
professionally at the moment? So I literally started a new job this week where I work in quality control in uniforms for work. So I'm now a key worker, apparently, because we supply the fire service. So it feels like I've got a purpose again, which is nice. What were you doing? So I, with the baking stuff as well, I'm I'm very interested in in that. I think almost more so interested in that. I have a very unusual outlook on work and work as an opposite to play because a lot of the people would look at the things that I do, perhaps you know, the tea company and the podcast and all these other things that I do and and say it does a lot of work, but I don't look at any of those things like that. And so those things are the things that I'm more interested in for you. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think that might be uh, the vegan baking. Yes. Well, I think that with all the time that I've had to like focus on it, it does make you reassess your goals. So before, like I was happy, well, not happy enough to just go into work do my job come home but now there's it's like added a new dimension to that where just going to work isn't enough and you need a little bit extra on top a little side hustle so obviously for me the baking was the main thing for quite a while and I was like if this was sustainable obviously I'd love for that to be a full-time thing but it just doesn't bring bring in enough money and it's hard to get a part-time job when you don't have a part-time job. It just seems to be like those two don't go hand in hand. So that was an option I did want to take. So I could keep up with the baking. But now it's another challenge, I guess, to reassess how it could work. Okay, I do have questions based on that. But why don't you just describe for the listeners what your, what the company name is, I guess, and what you do with baking? So... It's a very straightforward (laughs) business name because I'm called Jess and I bake vegan. So it's called Jess Bakes Vegan. Easy. Clever. Good to remember. Mm. Um, It was when I first started in lockdown, I was making a lot of vegan dishes and my friends were like, oh, you should take pictures of these. And I started a page on Instagram just so I remembered my meals. So if I ever got stuck on what to make, I'd go back and be like, oh, I enjoyed that. I'll make that tonight. And so it was called Jess Cooks Vegan before. But then when I started baking and the page become covered in cupcakes, it was changed to Just Bakes Vegan instead. <laughs> and so what have you been what have you been doing to kind of to make it a business then over the last, I don't know, is it like four or five months or so? So it was end of June that I took like my first orders. Um this, I don't know, it has gone from strength to strength and I have such a, a good little following and I think it is based on social media. The only way to have built my business was through word of mouth. There's been so it's mainly organic. There's been a little bit of paid advertising that I put out there as well, which has got me a bit more business. But it's definitely more like I knew that first of all, only friends were going to buy it because you have to trust someone with things like that. If it's food, especially. So I know you guys were customers, which I appreciated. And then when you start posting about it and more people see the tags and everything, that's when you can grow so there's people who'll reach out to me that I've never met before and talk to me like they know me and order from me which is great yeah I have something very similar with the tea company I feel like I almost have a very similar journey to talk about really with the tea company because that's always been at the beginning of the year that had been something that was just ancillary to everything else I was doing um it just I didn't really feel like I had the time to really give it so I couldn't promote it or push it as much as I could. Since lockdown, however, that has not been the case and I've had much more free time. And so I've focused on it a little more heavily and it's it really has exploded, I think would be the appropriate term. It, it's got, it, I mean, it's not a full-time income by any means, but it's doing, it's doing very well. I think that's one of the opportunities that are available in something like a lockdown, especially if you're furloughed or even if you've just got the extra time and and you don't have an income, but you have time. Um, is that how you kind of found that? Well, this is one of the things I've been saying like all along. It's either you have money and no time or no money and lots of time. <laughs> in terms of work, like if it's not money you already have, obviously, but if you go to work, you don't have that time. So it is a luxury 
to be able to take stock, sit back and do something you actually are really passionate about. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, that was one of the questions that struck me earlier on when you were talking about uh, the the work that you, the, the job that you've gone and got over the last and started this week and what you do with Jess Bakes Vegan. Uh, I wanted to ask what, what do you think of the role of work is for a person? Like what's the, what's the psychological benefit of going to work and, and can you get that from one and not the other or is it? I think one of the things that always bugs me about working for like a company is you are earning money for someone else's benefit. You are building someone else's dream. It's not like, yes, you can progress and yes, you can build your own career, but the end result is someone else is benefiting more than you are. But whereas with your own business, you are in control of that. You are the one that's benefiting. It's your dream. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I do. That's how I think about it. That's what I suggested earlier with the difference between uh, work and, and play, really. And I don't see... I mean, this has been how I have approached it for years now since working in music, really, and since, is the things that I, a lot of the things that I do, I I have work on one side, and for me at the moment, that's lush. That provides me with an income, that's all. What I get from the other things that would, it's like more playful, is that I get meaning from that instead. And so I think you get, there's more things that you can get from those, but a lot of people invest in their job in the hope that they will get meaning as well as an income. And and some people don't, and some people are on the other end of the spectrum and they just want to have the, the kind of playful and they're happy with the playful creative stuff where they don't care about money at all. It's all about meaning. And I think you've got to balance those things, really. I mean, hopefully... I mean, hopefully for anybody who who is creative and who wants to do something of their own, you can get that balance right, but eventually make the thing that's playful and creative that you are that you get meaning from. You can make that generate income as well. It's just like, I was just t- tired with this whole idea. Like I was getting more and more stressed about the fact I wasn't working and that I'd got made redundant. And I was like, if, like, if I was still on furlough, I would have been able to try and push my baking business more because I'd had that that backup of having the money coming in. But when that's taken away, your options are like so limited. It's like you almost go to survival mode. You're like, this is this side hustle that I really love doing. Is it sustainable or do I have to look for something else? So that was the point I was at, which makes things... It's a hard decision because... I didn't want to undo all of that good stuff I'd been doing. But I think I've, like, Instagram's such a good community in terms of support. Like, they are, like, it's not even because someone wants something out of you, they'll say something nice because that's what they mean it. And they'll be supportive, they'll share your page, they'll comment on it. And I don't think that'll go away, hopefully, (laughs) if I'm still having to take a step back. But, I mean, it is, it's like a, what's the word... I think with any of those things, it always just depends on what you want. For me, I want the thing that I'm creative with. I want I want my creativity, because I think that's, that's one of the things I'm better at, to make me money. And I don't really care about money. I just care about... I know that I'm earning... En- when I'm earning enough money is when I don't have to think about it. When I'm not stressed about where the next amount is coming in and fortunately I'm in a position where that is kind of where I am and I'm not having to spend 10 days a week elsewhere but I'm quite happy to pull back and not earn a lot and not have some of the luxuries it doesn't really bother me if I don't have luxuries so long as I can as long as I get a sense of real purpose I guess the question the question I asked or um oh maybe it would be better off rephrasing is like for you what is work doing is like are you getting the meaning from Jess Bakes Vegan or uh, and the money from the job or is the job in itself meaning as well like can you get it from there or is or are there other other things other factors that I've not included there I think it's a bit of a 
broader question in terms of like I can get it from both I mean it's been hard because the past week I've sort of put it on the back burner a bit because I've had to start this new job and it's tired me out um but every like it's been a really I'm in a very supportive team and the meaningfulness comes in the fact that I actually do feel appreciated and I do feel supported whereas obviously on my own running a business you feel supported because you have customers and people who like follow you in that way but you're alone in the grand scheme of things anything that happens is because you've done it or anything that does happen is because you didn't do it does that scare you more i mean it does i am very guilty of putting pressure on myself like my mum's always telling me like no one's expecting this of you you're just making yourself do it and stressing yourself out and I do do that because I think people expect it of me, but it's that's not true. So, like, in terms of doing, a, like, a maker's market, I'll give myself so much to do that I'm up all night, not sleeping, and I'm just tired, and it gets me all wound up. But I didn't have to do that to myself. That's the other factor there is this kind of the mental health component to it. Although I've been having a conversation over the last few weeks about kind of the relationship between in intelligence and happiness because there's a bit of an aphorism where people used to say that if you're smart you can't be happy because you're smart you have more ideas you want to do more with them and you don't think about happiness you're just about like accumulating wealth and and doing things and I'm I mean my experience is symptomatic of that I suppose I do I'm kind of furiously hard working like I just don't stop I'm always doing something as I say it doesn't really feel like work to me so it's not you know, most of the things I do just feel like fun things I want to do that I get something out of other than a wage or so that's good enough. But with this relationship between like intelligence and happiness, I heard somebody, I really like, wish I could remember his name, uh, I, but I can't, but I heard him say something um, along the lines of like, if you're smart, then you should be happy. You should be able to figure out how to be happy. And I think he was using he was using happiness in a different kind of way as well. He wasn't just talking about the happiness that you feel from having your favourite dessert or anything like that. It was like gen, uh, genuine kind of satisfaction with life, like well-being, just overall sense of well-being. And I was speaking to Dee about this because there's something about me and her that we just know how to be happy. Like I don't know, I don't know how we figured it out because it's not always been the case. I haven't always been happy but for the last I don't know five years or so I just know how to do that and so when it comes to work life balance and how I spend my time and how how much effort I put into things I think it always it always comes down to what well, always begins with my own health and my own well-being first it's like, I, and I can't, it's almost like I've forgotten how to put that out of the way and ignore my own cues, like physiologically, uh, physiological cues or mental cues or whatever that kind of say, hang on, you're doing something, you're doing something wrong here. You're doing something unpleasant to yourself. Like, what are you doing? Like, I can always catch myself doing that before it's too much. Um, I, I guess it's just a, a skill you learn, but how are you kind of you know the the story you were telling there was are you somebody who finds it easy to be happy or does that elude you mm, i'd say there it's it's waves of contentment like you think there's something in your life that's causing you an issue and then you just get rid of it and then that'll solve something but then there'll always be something else that bothers you or causes unhappiness i think like, because, I don't know, like, you can have a really great relationship, one day it turns sour, so then you get rid of that person out of your life, and then you think, oh, I'll get back to normal, but then you haven't, you're still, you've been brought down, your self-care's not where it was. So I think, like you say, as long as you put, like, your mental health and that and your well-being first and foremost and really assess how is this affecting me, is it doing me any good, that that is the right path to go down. Obviously, I don't do that. And I just see, I don't know, like, I'll put in the work and the struggle first thinking it will get me to that point. 
So, so I could be like, this is really hard. This is really not making me happy. I'm really anxious. But then I'm thinking, but if I do do it, then I'll get to that point. I, 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 I don't agree with, I mean, I don't do things like that. And I mean, it's possible that, that could work, but. I, d- I mean, this sounds really cruel, but I've said to, I've said in passing to people before that nobody deserves to be happy, and that sounds really cold and and quite Very nasty. Very cold. But I mean it literally. Uh, that you don't deserve to be happy. You have to learn to be happy. You have to develop the skill of being happy. It's something you have to know how to do. It doesn't come for free, which is what to me the word deserve implies that it's just something that is a a fundamental human right i don't think it is at all i think i mean i certainly don't feel like i deserve it uh because i'm that that to me permits me to do anything anything i like anything nasty things that are mean things that are unpleasant whereas i think if it's a skill if it's something you develop and something you learn how to do then it kind of entails that you don't do things that are nasty because it's just not it's not good for you to do them. Like it doesn't it doesn't make you happy to do to do uh morally gross things to people. It's just it's it is it's a, it's a skill. So I, I guess in your description of it there, the thing that struck me was that I think we might be talking about happiness in a different way. Um like there's there's a kind of because there is a superficial happiness I think for most people and it is that happiness of that you feel when things are going right but I I think there's like moods you have moods and you have states as well and that's like if you're I mean the best analogy the best example I can think of is is if you're upset say you've been to a funeral or something you can still laugh someone can still make you laugh and so the mood there is happiness it's like a brief moment of it's an interruption of your state of being which at the time is is not happy at all you know so there's these two levels and so i thought how you were i mean i may be wrong with this by the way as well but i thought how you were describing happiness was more upper level kind of more superficial rather than that lower just general state of happiness and that one is the one that i think people want to strive for but they 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 try and aim for the the other one instead the wrong one and because they never quite get sustainably happy they think it doesn't exist or that you can't achieve it or you can't get it but it's because they're chasing a fool's errand does that sound like a a fair description of your outlook on happiness or am i being am i missing the point i think it is accurate to a degree because i don't like like say the beginning of this year i thought maybe buying this new coat would make me the happiest girl in the world like i was very materialistic everything it was like the next thing, the next thing, next thing. And that's not true happiness because you're always trying to fill a void that you've created. So in that sense, I think it was trying to get to a higher level. Like if I did this, this is how I'd be happy. It's not like finding gratitude in the current situation. But I have tried to be more mindful of that, definitely. Like even I was writing gratitude lists every day and sending them to D and just being like, today I went for a walk and I saw a dog like nothing ex- like nothing crazy just like there's hardly anything to get excited about I will find something that makes me feel content for today and be grateful that I've got amazing friends and family and supportive people around me and in that sense I was trying to instill a sense of happiness I guess because everything was so topsy-turvy that if you were trying to look at the bigger picture, you would just be miserable. The way I'm thinking about it is like, that sounds like it's trying to make happiness from the top down mm. rather than the bottom up. You know, instead of kind of... It's like of, on a pedestal. It's almost like you're you're trying to will yourself into happiness rather than just feeling your way in uh, towards it. And that's because, I, I don't know, there's a, lot of thi- there's a lot of things there, but I do think partly it's to do with the the, the cultural attitudes towards happiness and well-being and i think there's a bit of a 
a misguided attempt to find at the wrong thing. You know, it's a it's a red herring if you like, um, and people are just aiming at the wrong thing, thinking it will make them happy. Which is why we have a, a consumerist economy and people buy things to make them happy. And I say people as if that's distant from me, but it's not like I've gone through that when I was a bit younger, but actually probably close to your age now when I was working in music more. I used to just buy music equipment all the time thinking that that would be it. I'm like, oh, I'll buy this and I'll I'll feel better. And I, and I say that I thought that, but I didn't think it. It wasn't verbally there in my head in words. It was just like an intuition that, oh, I just need this thing. I'll get this, get this thing and, and that, that'll be good. And then you'd get it and it would feel good for a few seconds, clicking purchase and then that's it. It's just, it's kind of nothing. I think the for me, and I'm sure this would be universally true, is you get to that lower state, that kind of more from the bottom up kind of happiness, just by finding finding some kind of purpose as as cliche as that sound, but it's like a sense of meaning from the thing from the ways that you're spending your time and knowing why you're doing things. I can spend some of my time working at Lush. It's like not really how I would choose to spend my time. It's good enough, but it's not how I would choose to spend it. But I can justify doing that knowing that overall that just fits into a grander scheme for me, like a personal aim and personal sets of goals. And it's good enough. It's good enough as long as it all feeds back into this general bigger sense of, of purpose. And I think that's it, it for most people. Everyone's chasing meaning and everyone's chasing purpose and very few people have it. That's my rant there. And that might not stand for you like... Uh, you meant we we opened this really by you just saying that you do get some meaning from kind of the nine to five job as well as the as the baking. Mm -hmm. But you have to look for that meaning. It's not just there. Oh, totally, totally. It's the it's part of the same skill set that allows you to find happiness. It is kind of the same thing almost. Like the happiness is the meaning. Like once you find meaning, you found this kind of happiness that everybody wishes they had. It's just you've got to you've got to look really hard and you've got to know a lot about yourself. And not just yourself, you've got to know a lot about how you interact with other people and how they interact with you. And you've got to know a lot about your environment and what you're capable of. And I don't know if if everyone's introspective enough or interested or curious enough about themselves. I think maybe people take themselves for for granted, if anything. Like, I really try hard not to. I think people are interested anyway, but which is why I do the podcast. I find it really interesting speaking to people, but I've spent a long time just trying to figure me out. Well, what do I do? How do I think? How do I feel? Why do I do the things that I do? I just don't know if anybody else does that to the degree that I do. I'm sure other, some people do, but I don't know how common it is. I mean, where do you think you fit into that? Is is this how you spend your time kind of reflecting on yourself or are you more outward? Um, I think I am quite inward. Like I have been trying to, I know when I'm neglecting myself, I know when I need to take a step back and do some self-care and I am very cruel to myself and very self-critical. So, like, for example, I go to the gym, but I still, like, more, the more I go, the more I look at myself and see things wrong. Like, I'm not, like, why is this not changed? Why am I not seeing progress here? And it's because you've got these higher expectations of yourself the more you do it. Um, But I do, but then I'll talk to someone and I need someone to tell me, basically. I can't process this on my own. I need someone to snap me out of it because I do just get carried away in my head, I think. Um, like, even with the baking, like, I'd make something and be like, oh, I don't like this, it doesn't look right, or I'm not, like, I just wouldn't be happy with it. Whereas someone else would be like, oh, my God, these are amazing, I love them, and I'd be like, I don't believe you because I don't think it. So it has to be something... Like, people can... I'm very bad at taking compliments, basically. <laughs> like, so then that's hard for you to reassess and reprocess your own feelings about yourself when you... No one can validate that. So it always has to come from within. Yeah, and it's hard as well because there's no real training on how to think about yourself. And, 
like what the process should be. I liken it to, and this is quite a visual uh, metaphor f- for me, I, I think, but this is how I think about what's going on in your mind is it's that it's like a deep pool. And when people complain about uh, th- they're overthinking, when they use words like overthinking more than anything else, they're kind of ruminating. It's like swimming along the surface of the this pool and not realizing that there's all this depth beneath it. Um, and people don't know how to swim to the bottom, if you like. But that's where all the interesting stuff is. So as an analogy for for kind of introspection in a person, I think people go round in circles. They swim round in circles when they're thinking and they don't really... When they use the word overthink, what they mean is swimming round in circles. And what they don't mean and what they're not doing is swimming downwards, like really looking hard. And it's, it's, that's difficult to do because there's, there's not really any... It's difficult to find guidance on how to do it. I mean, I picked some of these things up, I guess, from meditating, but I don't really know what, I, what I'm doing. I know it's hard with things with the mind. Is like There's no exact science to it. And that is a good analogy, though, because, I mean, like, if you are overthinking, you are go, you are coming back to the same things over and over again. That's when you get so stuck in your head. You can't get out of that cycle. I think it's just recognising as well, recognising that, hang on, I've I've been here before. I've already thought this thought, or I've already swam this circle. Like, am I going to keep doing this, or am I going to go look somewhere else? Uh, I just don't have the patience. I think once I catch myself in those moments and, and and notice what I'm doing, I'm quite. That's where I'm quite harsh on myself, and I, I'm not very forgiving. And I think, what are you doing to yourself? What are you doing to yourself there? It's like you're wasting time is what you're doing. There's so many other things that you could be thinking about and putting your mind to use and you're just going around the same pattern over and over again. It's a waste. It's a waste of time and it's unhelpful. I feel like a, this, I feel like it's a, this is the joy of these podcasts is they always go off on the most unexpected tangents, but it's nice. That's just like life. It's fine. It is. There you go. Analogy after <laughs> analogy here. Let's bring it back to the baking. Bring it back to me, um, come on. No, bring it back to you. Let's make it about the baking. That was the uh, therapy, therapy hour <laughs> over there for both I'll, of us. We all need some therapy. I'm sure we'll come back to that topic anyway. You can't escape it. It's, it's too interesting. But what I do really want to know is, like, there's a couple of things that I want to speak about in regard to baking. One of them is is taste. And what I mean by that is, when you're baking, what is it? What is it that tells you you've made something that's tasty? Um, for want of a better word, in terms of baking, for want of a better word, moistness. Okay. So I know when I take my buns out of the oven, if they've got a good, like, squeezy moistness to the bottom, then it's a good one. Obviously checking that it's baked through, like, with my little stick. But if it's got that to it, I know it's a good crumb. We're good. So that's, so that's like texture. Yeah, I guess it is more texture based. Because obviously, like most of the time, I bake them. I don't actually try them because I'm doing them to order. So it's all very visual and aromatic. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't mean to. I don't mean to suggest that uh, texture has little to do with taste. I, uh, on the contrary, I don't think that at all. A lot with the a lot with the teas, like the the texture. And like the the mouth feel, if you like, is a really important part of the 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 taste experience. Like you need that; it's got to have the right texture. And it's the same with food, as far as I can tell. I mean, what so what are the other elements? Because I feel like I interrupted you a little. I there. think the mouth feels like the best description I've ever heard, and I'm going to use it going forward. <laughs> oh, nice. But I think I heard that on one of the other podcasts I did with a friend, uh, Jack Byrne, who's really into his coffee. And he was talking about it like that when I kind of stopped yeah, with him. Yeah, so. I like it. Um, so what else makes me know that they're a good bake? Is that what you're saying? Well, it's something like that. It's actually more of a question about your actual, your personal taste and your personal preferences. Like when you are, when you're having something to eat or something that you enjoy, what is it, what is your experience like there that makes you think this is doing it for me? 
I just, I feel like I need a multi-layered experience. I'm not a bland gal. I need some seasoning, I need some bit of spice. Whereas obviously with cupcakes, it's more about, so you've got your two layers, you've got your cake, which is probably the blandest part. And then the decoration, the icing, making it look pretty. Um, so, I th and then I'm, I like a good, I like sweet. That's the only reason I started doing it because vegan cake is hard to come by in the lockdown. Even the supermarkets didn't really bother. All the, it's all gluten free, but includes egg. So you can't even go down that route. So then I was like, right, that's it. I'm baking my own because this is the only way I can get any. Not that I knew how to do it. I had to learn <laughs> because it's not as easy as it sounds when you take egg out of a recipe. You need an egg. No, I bet. Because that's the emulsifier, like the oil that binds it all. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I'm not much of a baker, but I can cook okay. And when you do burgers, you use egg for the very same reason to kind of thicken and solidify and glue it all together what is it that you use instead so i didn't want when i first started looking into alternatives the first one i found was flax seed so it was called a flax egg so you basically mixed flax seed with water and oil i think um so i was doing that and i like could as a replacement but it was making them a bit too healthy if you know what i mean so it was like the mixture was quite whole meal looking and I was like oh okay yeah. I, that doesn't look like a normal cupcake so then the other recipes included um apple cider vinegar and I was like oh I don't want to make a cupcake with vinegar in it but that's that is what I use now and you wouldn't know oh wow because if when you put it in it sort of like fizzes so it has like a react you can hear it reacting with like the oil and the milk to like bond it so presumably it not a uh, full fat organic milk there. Oh either. no, of course, only the plant based <laughs> kind. <laughs> yeah. Is it? I mean, I don't know if that's relevant or an interesting question to ask, but what, what alternative do you use for these things? I mean, I use O because then you bypass an allergen of using soya. So some people have come to me and said, I've got a soya allergy. So then I'll be like, well, mass sponges don't have any soya in. But then things like Biscoff does. So then it depends on, obviously, how you decorate it. It's, it's just interesting. Like, I wouldn't know what any of these like, on of alternatives are. I mean, it's it's obviously there's a market there for that, as well. if you were only really doing that full-time for two, three months and there was already the em an emergent business. Yeah, like I was having requests. Because there is, a, it is like a gap in the market I didn't realise was as big as it is, like, whereas pe where people, like a woman messaged me because her daughter was, like, allergic to eggs and milk like it wasn't a case like I'm a vegan it was a case of I need to find something that suits her diet her like allergies which is really sad because she's never known a life without being allergic to these things um but then no like people who aren't vegan do eat them and wouldn't know they were vegan like you <laughs> and you tried them you didn't know yeah. so it's not like well that's all that matters yeah. to me I don't really I don't care one way or another if it's vegan or if it's not vegan. If it tastes good, it tastes good. It's when I'm talking to the tea blenders who blend the tea with me, I always have this saying, it's like, it's all in service of the blend. Like it's all in service of something else. And for me, it's the blend. I don't really care so much what we do within reason. <laughs> but as long as the, I want the best taste experience that you can possibly get. And if it means that it's vegan so be it if not so be if, it oh if anything really it's mind. only a positive it opens up the market yeah. the more vegan it is the more people could eat it yeah yeah well that's it i mean it's got a bit of a bad rep I really know. as well vegan food this is one of the things um, that i don't know me. how much that's changing but I, I, it has had a bad rep for being tasteless and inedible but to be fair these days i get less confrontation about it than I used to so I mean the first thing you get asked is how do you not eat bacon don't you want when you smell bacon don't you just want to eat it and I'm like no that's why I committed to this lifestyle <laughs> because if I could I could do it I could go eat some now if I wanted to like there's nothing stopping me like they think that I've got like this hold over me or something um but no no one's like because some people try and challenge you make out like you're making a bad choice and making things worse for the planet 
and it's just like oh, I just can't um but I was like with the I don't know it just seems to be a lot of better there's like even with eating you know with the plant-based burgers sausages whatever they're like well why do you want it when it looks like meat and it's like well it's not I'm not opposed to a burger I'm supposed to be made of meat it's a personal preference I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't really ever see the interest in criticising people if they want to eat what they want to yeah. eat. Go for it. Like, it's not really any... It, this is something that always perplexes me when people are, I don't know, homophobic or uh, they want to tell other people how to eat or racist or any of these things is, how can you be bothered what other people are doing? I just don't... I spend very little time caring. <laughs> it's, 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 it's as soon as... It's as soon as people start infiltrating on my territory and telling me what I'm supposed to do or telling me that I'm immoral or moral or making some kind of normative claim about my behavior, that's when I'm kind of, that's when my ears prick up and I'm more confrontational about it. I mean, I don't really think, my my personal view of veganism is that I think on the one hand, it's doing something really wonderful in that it's, it's developing alternatives to me. And so it is easy to say that it's cruel if free on the other hand in about i don't think in i think in 10 15 years time i don't think anybody will be vegan anymore which might sound like i'm trying to be shocking or something like that but i'm not i just mean that i don't i also don't think that many people will eat meat from a animal that's been alive i think people who eat meat will eat it grown from a dish because that's already a technology that we have you can already grow a steak from a cell culture so in 10 15 years time when that becomes economical and less costly i think most people will just eat meat that was never an animal and that kind of largely solves the problem of of cruelty what but what vegan what makes ve- vegan veganism now so important is that it does develop very clever alternatives to some of the other things that we wouldn't have if we stop growing animals, such as eggs and milk and dairy products. We won't have those necessarily. Maybe we'll be able to grow those too. But in any case, I think the pursuit of knowledge is always a good thing. So if we're developing clever alternatives and using ingredients in a different way, I'm all for it. Yeah, because I think that's one of the problems where people sometimes think, well, we've always eaten meat, so that's all we will do. But then... Just because people did stuff in the past hundreds of years ago isn't how it should be necessarily because, I mean, there's a lot of bad things that happened which were abolished, but that just, people could be like, well, we've always done this. So I do think progression is always the way forward. And if you've watched the David Attenborough documentary on Netflix... The new one, there's a new yeah, one, isn't it? Yeah, I think it was like last week or so it came out. That is very eye-opening and you should definitely check it out because he talks about... Oh, yeah, I will. Like, even, it goes to like 20, the year 2080 and like how the planet will be if we carry on living in the way that we're living. And living a plant-based diet was part of the way to help just like go back on that um, temperature rise. Because it all starts from the ocean and overfishing and like killing all the coral that feeds the microorganisms, that feeds the fish, that feeds the land. So it was... Yeah, well, it's greed that does it, isn't it? Well, mainly. It's all money, isn't it? I do, I do th- yeah, and I do think people eat more than they need to eat too. Like people eat three meals a day and they're advised to do that by their doctors and that is the most stupid advice how many meals should you I eat, think of. I eat isn't three well, normal you eat you eat when you're hungry that's what you've got hunger for you shouldn't need to be told to have three meals a day if you're hungry you eat and then when you're not you stop and if that's three meals a day for you great if it's one meal a day for you great probably isn't but you know eat when you're hungry it's, it's a really simple rule and eat the right things. And I don't think people do that either. I mean, that's part of when I say greed is this kind of people think they should be paying, I don't know what, 20p for a chicken fillet. And it's like, it's no wonder that they've got to cut some corners somewhere to make that animal suffer as much as as much as physically possible because you're paying 20p for a piece of meat. What do you, what do you expect? That was alive. It's like, there's no way you can get it that cheap. It's worth more. I never understand how people keep sheep. 
<laughs> you don't get much. You Why? don't get much you from a sheep, do you really? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Wool, yeah, but not I guess. very often. It's like every I don't know four months you shear a sheep, and then you get. Um, I have literally no wool's idea. Wool's like worth. It's worth a bit more than that it used to be. Not much. Yeah, I literally have no clue. <laughs> no clue at all. I like the idea of having animals at some point in my life. I could totally imagine having a little farm for myself with just a just a few cows and and things like that. I, I like. I love that idea. Being self-sustainable is a different thing. Like, if you're not built buying into that mass market of production, where it said one of my friends had on his Fitbit, it told him how many animals he'd saved by being vegan for only three months, and it made out like he was he would have killed an animal a day by from like the meat industry, dairy industry, egg industry, whatever, because it isn't just like I've eaten a cow today. It's bigger than that. Um. Whereas if you're like self-sustainable, you're growing your own veg, you have a cow that you milk because it's it can produce milk, not a cow that's artificially inseminated so it has a calf so it produces milk. Then it's a less cruel cycle. And you know how those animals are being treated, obviously, because they're yours. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, I'm big on zero waste. I don't like to waste anything at all if I can. It does not to say that I don't waste things still. Not, you know, I'm only human. I, I do the best I can. But when it comes to, I mean, I have a few, quite a few vegan friends and I, there was one I was speaking to a couple of years ago about this who who said she was getting some flack from her vegan colleagues at work because she was wearing leather boots. And her attitude to that was like, well, listen, these are boots. They're already boots. They've been made. They're going to go in the bin. Should I wear them and use them or should I throw them in the bin and waste them? It's like, if I use this product, then that's, I don't need to go and get any alternative anywhere else. I'm, I'm using it right now. I think it depends if she already had them. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that, 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 was, that was the case. Yeah, she already had yeah. them. Yeah, because I've got like products that I know have probably been tested on animals because they're part of Clinique and they do. But I'm like, well, I already have this to use. So I'm not just going to waste it and throw it away. Like, that is the same thing, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, totally. It's a hard thing to balance, and there's a lot of there's a lot of ethics that you've got to try and it juggle. So I think people can only do the best that they possibly can. Um, for me personally, like, zero waste is the big one for me. Like, kind of, um, what's the term that I've heard used? I don't think it's sustainability, but it's something else. I, mean, I forget what it is. But zero waste in any way, just almost like being carbon neutral, like that's the thing that I'm more interested in. That that's my personal aim is to just uh, have no footprint in terms of like energy use and in terms of like food waste, any of these things. Like I'm I'm really quite big on that, and sometimes that means that I'll use. I would rather use in the short term everything from an animal than bits and pieces. I know it was a big controversy a few years ago about people using um they decided to use animal fats in the five pound notes, didn't mm-hmm. they? I got really and, angry and about of, that. Uh, yeah, and so so did a lot of people. But I mean, my view was that though, if there's the materials there and they're going to go to waste otherwise, use them. Yeah, but then that's like I don't understand gelatin in sweets because that's a that's a a byproduct. But that means I can't eat them. <laughs> then it's like a gross thing that you can easily make veggie. Yeah, I think most people prefer the idea of having veggie as well in that case. Because it's like this, you just don't think, oh, this nice Haribo is going to have meat in it. Yeah, there's a lot of things like that as well. I guess it was it was less a claim about whether veganism was right or wrong that I was just saying. It was more of a claim of like, okay, if we already have this stuff, all of these core materials that we've achieved from an animal, then while I have them, I should use as much of it as I possibly can because to not do that is wasteful. Um. But then it gets it kind of when it when it meets reality, you know that's just a nice abstract notion. But when that meets reality, and all of a sudden I've got five pound notes with animal fats in and gelatin in, in jelly beans, then it starts becoming a bit more difficult to main to maintain. But then again, that's it. We're only people are only human, so it's hard to do. We keep going off on these crazy tangents. It's great. Let's talk about cake. Come on. Yeah, I'm gonna rein it. I'm gonna rein it back in. We were talking about taste, and we went th- we went through texture as one of the kind of components of 
of, of taste. Um, the question that is really kind of crucial for me, and the thing because it's the thing that I don't really understand, um, and and maybe you would have a better way of describing it than me. It is to do with like. Let me think how to phrase this. When you're when you're preparing something, when you're kind of baking something, one of the things that you notice that the thing is ready is when it's got a certain texture. But in terms of taste, how are you getting that balance between the different possible tastes? Because for people who haven't cottoned on yet, you mostly do, I think, cookies and cupcakes. And so that's mostly, I guess, sweet. <laughs> I should hope it's, so. It's, you know, you're probably not getting many of the other sort of uh, the salty. different tastes there. Yeah, salty. Um, I, I doubt, but I don't know. So I'm asking, I'm asking you, like, wh- what? How do you get the balance right? Like, is it is it something that's kind of cognitive and you're thinking about, or is it something that just kind of falls into place? I've just followed the same recipe and it's worked for me, which is a relief. <laughs> I mean, the it's when you add in. I guess, like, alien substances and you're experimenting, like putting in fruit, for example, messes things up. Fruit, it makes things... So, like, a standard cake recipe is pretty... You can you know what to expect from it. Like, it will come out the same every time, usually. When you add in something like raspberries, it can go, it can go totally wrong. And it can do the same thing every time. And it's just, like you've messed with the status quo a little bit. Um, even with, like, when I put... I didn't realise cocoa powder is a raising agent, so you should take out flour to, like, make up for the fat you're putting in um, cocoa powder. But then I sometimes would mix up all of my batter for um, for the cake in one go, and then I'd do, like, if there's vanilla, I'd put all them in, and then I'd cocoa powder so I'd had I'd had one time when I'd done some that were like this like really small just like normal size cupcake and then the the chocolate ones were like muffins and that was just from adding a little bit of so I mean it is a like I've always said it is trial and error like sometimes they maybe aren't cooked through enough especially with the raspberries in and then that's why I always tell people to give me like honest criticism tell me if there's something that's not gone right and I will like know what it is and fix it raspberries are a funny one as well because we have that in in your log and they get the quite like a bitter mm. acidic yeah kind of taste them it's definitely the um, acid so in imagine... them that it seems to react yeah. well the different temperatures do different things to different ingredients as well and i guess that's the it's the reason i use we use some synthetic flavoring um you know it's not my preferred choice but the virtue of synthetic flavoring that we use is that it's stable and it's predictable it does the same thing every time. Whereas if it's a natural product, you do not have that guarantee. It's going to be slightly different every time. You can see that in some of the teas that I do in your log as a good example. Carrot cake and the carrot itself, pumpkin spice. All of these have ingredients that look different every time I order it. Every time I get some uh, ordered in and packed at the, at the warehouse, it's it looks different. It's like it's a different shade of red or a different shade of orange depending on the ingredient. And it's a different sort of... A subtle difference in taste, but that's what you get. It's a natural ingredient. Mm. What do you expect? Yeah. So you've got to try and juggle those things, which is to tie it back in. Why I always say it's in service of the blend. I'll use the synthetic ingredient if it means I can get the blend right. That doesn't mean I'm going to just use synthetic ingredients and just, you know, kill it and kill everything that's good about it. But if I have to use it, and then I'm, I'm happy to so long as the blend is improved good enough for me that is definitely like to do with the consistency like if you want to have a consistent flavor you can't put in these like i can use an orange to you to get the zest out of it sometimes it just doesn't it do, nothing comes out of it and it's just an orange whereas other times it's really strong so and because i'm not i'm using natural flavoring it sometimes my mum or whoever tries it but like, it's not that orangey today and i'm like well, i use an orange like i always do whereas if i get artificial flavoring then i know what it'll taste like it's always the same it's consistent so i mean it's a shame because obviously you want to say oh i'm using natural ingredients and homegrown organic things but it, it's like at the risk of maybe the taste like you said yeah 
that's it. It's a hard thing to balance. Um, um, there is a, I mean, it's not as if this is a eternal thing, but there is a bit of a naturalistic fallacy in play. Like people think because people think natural equals good. At the moment, it's not always been the case, but right now people think natural equals good. And so you can throw around words like or, organic or natural and it'll sell just on the grounds that the words sound pleasing um, artificial, synthetic, they don't sound as, as as sexy and as appealing to people. But I do think that it's just to, people need to realign their views a little bit there is because there are reasons, like people rebel against synthetic ingredients because of maybe the common produce 10 years ago or, or so before veganism really took off. When it was just everything in it was synthetic, everything in it was fake. And, you know, I mean... I don't want to name drop because I, I mean, I don't know if anything really springs to mind anyway, but I'm thinking more to do with like energy drinks and, uh, you know, where they're like, they're like nuclear water. And it's like, that's just, that's just purely synthetic. So I could see why you would want to rebel from that and do something that's uh, in air quotes, like natural. But I don't think it's the be all and end all. I think the flavor is, the flavor is the important thing. And it's, it, to me, it seems better to, again, and less wasteful if you are not making new things and you're just using things that are already existing. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Like, it's since, like, artificial colorism and flavors have had a bad press, to be honest. And we all know why. But um, organic and things like that is such a buzzword. Like, people just want to throw it in there because they think it'll sell things better. I mean, like, even in... I do some cookies that are, like, the healthy version. So I use, like, spelt flour, which is organic and better than just average plain flour. But, I mean, I, I'm only using it because people say they don't like things being too sweet. So it makes it a bit more of a whole meal vibe for people. I don't know why people would come to me and say I want something that's not that sweet when I bake cake, but they do. <laughs> like you can't please everyone to be fair i probably i would probably be like that like i don't have a huge t sweet tooth and too sweet easily puts me off it's got to be kind of tempered with with other stuff going on i mean it's to be expected when it's cake it's gonna have sugar in it yeah i guess i just think of things like salted caramel as a good example or even chocolate is you're not just getting sweet you're getting you well you're getting salt in salted caramel so it's like the sweet and the salt that you got kind of and like chocolate, you've got that bitter taste, that kind of astringency. And so I like those sorts of tastes rather than just pure sweetness is just too much, is too much for me. Um, maybe it's like you said, you like balanced tastes. So you like things a bit more complicated and it's, it's kind of touching on a, on a few more of those receptors in your tongue. Like that's how I feel. Okay. Question it's to do with recipes. We were speaking roughly about experimentation. Do you usually begin with a recipe or do you make your own sometimes? You I recipe. Try, so a lot of people try and veganize recipes. So I looked, I've had a lot of time to look into this. So I was reading about it and it said like, if you've got this, you substitute it for this, blah, blah. So I tried it and it did not work. I just ended up with really flat pancake cupcakes, which weren't going to go anywhere except the bin. So... I, fa I just started using actual recipes that had already been veganized and then adapting it. So obviously this was just a basic vanilla sponge. And I'd be like, well, I'm going to do a chocolate orange version. I'm going to do, um, what other, <laughs> the raspberry one. <laughs> what other flavors do I do now? Um, salted caramel is one. So it's all to do with your flavour, is really, but it came from one starting point. Um, the cookie recipe that I do is actually based on the Pret a Manger cookie. So they released their recipe, and I stole it and changed it <laughs> by adding chocolate orange to it. And I can honestly say because I ordered that, like I hadn't been to Pret in ages, and I ordered some of their vegan bakes to try them. And the cookie wasn't as nice as my cookie, even though it had the same recipe. So I don't think that was the real recipe that they like let out because it was too... I suppose they do do fresh things, though, don't they? It's not as if they need to, like, keep it 
with like loads of additives and preservatives or anything so maybe i don't know it could have been the same but it didn't taste like it yeah i, I would say it's not theft either especially if they publish the recipe but it's not theft in it. any case <laughs> that well and, and cre- that's just how creativity works and gets better like i'll like it's it's not it's not really a secret like if i like i put out music or something like that if somebody wants to copy the music that i've written go for it go for it like at the end of the day you'll you'll never be you still won't be me doing that music like but if somebody else could do it better you go for it yeah like good on the you. creative industry isn't about standing on each other's toes anyway it's to do with like there's enough to go around there's enough people to listen to your music there's enough people to buy your cakes so you don't have to have a war that's it uh, and plus you know there's only one you whoever that might be and so like nobody else could do the music that i'm doing or do the tea stuff that i'm doing no there is no other per- there is literally no other person who does who studies philosophy hosts a podcast uh has a tea company and writes music there's nobody else there's there is nobody else who does that although does all of those things like that's that's a very niche market and a very niche thing that i'm doing I mean, do you have your own niche in that way do you think i think my maybe selling point is my, like i did, at first i was gonna hide behind the cake and just be like oh these are my cakes and keep my personality out of it but now i put my personality into it and i think that is the difference because people aren't buying a product because they think it looks nice and maybe more buying it because they like me it just helps that the cakes are nice it might help i mean if they weren't nice i'd know about it (laughs) no i think you're right though i think people really do care about personality more than they have done for a long time but i noticed like again with the tea company less with with anything else but with the tea company people people care about knowing who's buying from Mm -hmm. yeah they want to see a i mean i want to see a personality i want to buy from a person so if i'm looking on instagram for ideas i don't know chocolatiers or whatever i care about the person making them and like their whether i can relate to them whether they seem on my wavelength or not like the chocolate can look great but a lot of people can make chocolate great it's like but i don't know in your case like a lot of people can make vegan cookies but not a lot of them are you none of them are me only one of only one of them are, so... I was going to say the thing that I think stands out, and I think it'll be the same in terms of shopping small um, and independent, that you, if you don't see the person who's behind that brand, you build up your own picture of who they are and what they look like. And some of them I'm like, oh, they must be really like, they seem really posh and they seem to be really successful and they don't need my business. Whereas, obviously, like, if you're more honest and open with people and be like, this week's been hard, I actually haven't got that much on, people might be more sympathetic and be more like, oh, well, I only didn't order because I didn't think you needed, the, you were busy or you needed the orders. And it gives you more of a, to stop seeing you as a business and see you more on a personal level. Because I've had that before with people. Like, there's this one person I was speaking to who made chocolate, like you said. They were, they were like really beautiful little gourmet truffles. And... I'd been speaking to them just because I was saying, oh, they're, like, they're amazing. Um, and I was speaking to them for a while until I found out what they were, like, the name of the person, and they were called Chris. So, and then they said they had to move away and that they were going to be split up from the girlfriend. So I thought this whole time I'd been talking to a woman who was who was a lesbian and had a girlfriend when it actually was a man called Chris. But he... I don't know because he never. There was nothing ever that said this was a man or a woman. But the way that it was quite a feminine product with how the chocolate came across, I just made that assumption, and that was that's a mistake. I think that on his part, he didn't have that personality in there for you to know. Yeah, people will assume one way or the other as well. Like that is just kind of they will fill in the gaps themselves. It's just a normal expectation for people to have to want to deal with a person. It's like it's unavoidable i think that's one thing that is completely unavoidable it's just something in our psychology that we 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 desire so you can't get around from that i think and that's one of those things in the next i don't know 10 15 years again really it's like artificial intelligence is going to probably 
offload a lot of the jobs that a lot of people are currently doing and thinking are valuable. Um, and so what's what's left? And and for me, I think the only thing that's left is the only thing that I don't think any artificial intelligence is likely to be able to do in the next, uh, I would say like next 50 years is to be able to feel and to do the things that that is what people can do that a machine couldn't, which is to feel and, and have a kind of an intimate, personable experience with somebody else, which is why for me, that's less, you can see the, the general retail market pushing that way. Anyway, people are desiring personal, uh, bespoke experiences more than they ever have done before which is odd because you never would have thought that because most people have shifted towards not shopping on the high street and shopping on amazon clicking a button and getting what they want but i think it's changed i think people use amazon or some other site online to browse look around at things they like get ideas but then go into a store and speak to a human being i think more like the high street is for people who don't know what they're looking for so, like, I want to go for a browse, I want to see what's around, whereas, like, I, if I know I want to buy something, like, I need this book off Amazon, I'll just go buy it off Amazon. Like, there's no point going out. It's Yeah, I suppose it's like the high street is now the shop window. Yeah, like, even... Th- the entire high street yeah. is the shop window. <laughs> like, Waterstones is the Amazon shop window. Yeah, fully. <laughs> Absolutely. It's so Absolutely. bad. How are they still alive? I don't know. But, um... But then again, in the flip side, I was looking for a new coat on Zara and I was like, oh, I don't know if I trust it on the website. I want to look at it in the shop because it could be a different colour. It could not suit me. And then you've wasted that time waiting for it to come when you could have gone and looked quicker. So, I mean, it does have its pros, but it is, again, like a window shop experience, but I could buy it while I'm out. Yeah, well, those shops are having to improve now because the, the pandemic, if anything, has accelerated trends that were already emerging so everything there is going to be so much quicker. And in, in a way, this brings us back to the beginning when we were talking about work and play and kind of without mentioning it explicitly, we were talking about job security and, and risks and the kind of like the, the comfort that it provides when you've got a steady income. I don't think that's on the cards for many people anymore. Like that that security in the in the next 10 years, that you that's that's gone bye-bye for so many jobs. I think it's just because so many jobs are completely replaceable by a machine. Mm-hmm. It's scary. So easy to replace. Um, I, th- I mean, it, I would say that any office work is probably one of those things, uh, which is, that's what most people I think are probably doing these days, working in offices or driving. And it's, they're all, they'll be gone. Machines can do them better. So they'll be gone. So it, I think it's all to do with, with, with personality. At least it will be. No, I think Um, that's one thing we've learned this year, like who's needed and who isn't. When you feel like I've got a career that no one needs me to do, it's quite hard. Because, like, I was the only one out of most of my friends that wasn't working and put on furlough. Like, one of them was a teacher, one of them's a therapist, one of them works for the NHS. So they were, like, safe and I'm, I, but then again, this all comes down to working in the arts. Because if it's creative, it's not as essential. It's a luxury that people can live without. Yeah, I think that's that, that view is absolutely, I mean, it's bang on. That's exactly what a lot of people think, but it's completely absurd. And it makes no sense in, in my view. I mean, what's, is, is that where you were kind of going with that? No, I mean, it's not what, it's not what I believe, obviously. Oh, of course not. But no, it's no. just how it is. <laughs> like, yeah, no. it's how the government make it seem when they post stupid adverts about ballerinas. Oh, yeah, I saw um, that That is just like the arts is like a waste of time. What you bother with that for? It's You need an actual vocation and they don't want to fund it and all the theatres are closed. So you just like pushed into look like with my job search which was like three months long um it was hard because people wouldn't even tell like i even got a message this week from a recruiter telling me they hadn't heard back about a job i had like a month ago people like they just don't understand that you're in this desperate situation and you need answers like by by not hearing from a job you think you still have a chance of getting that job so you've not been told otherwise um but these are in jobs which 
again was like high street supermarket maybe supplying to them but whereas now I've got a job where I supply to key workers which is like a relief because they'd be like we've done really well out of the lockdown we've made loads of we've got loads of business out of it because we've provided all these this PPE and stuff so it's like your priorities change, whereas I'm like, oh, I do love fashion. I love fast fashion. And you get loads of free clothes and like the superficial way of looking at it. But then the long term way is that's I could lose my job again next year if I do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, even then it's they, that job, even key workers, all of these jobs right now, they're key workers. And right now they're considered essential in a, a very short space of time. They those jobs will be obsolete. And so those people will be out of work. I, I just don't see. I I can't imagine in 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 ten years' time that many people are going to work in a supermarket, unless unless something drastically changes with the experience there. But if people want to be in and out, there are. It is not. It's not a. It's a key position, working in a supermarket, in that we all need food. But if we could replace it with machines, we would. And the problem is for those people that we can do that already it's just not cheap enough because if you think about it i you can go into the into a supermarket and not speak to anyone you can just go yeah, I get do. your stuff self check out off you go that's it that's your whole social interaction for the day and I, d- I don't think many people surely some do but i don't think many people go to the supermarket for a social experience they just want to be in and out and I just, I, I, I do worry about that. Is like a lot of jobs now that have been being deemed key or essential. It's just that's a that's a figment of someone's imagination. That's it's an illusion. It's like that is that is not a key worker. That is not essential. That job will not exist in ten years' time. And telling people it is essential encourages people to get into that line of work. It deceives them into getting into that line of work and they're going to think that they've got some kind of security that just isn't there. I do think that's maybe true for like supermarkets, but not so much for like the emergency services. Yeah, no, I agree with that. But even then, some of the, some doctors and some, so um, I I forget the technical term of people who study x-rays, but those jobs will be gone. Like artificial intelligence can look at an x-ray better than a person can. They can can see shades of grey that we can't. So there's a lot of jobs in hospitals that can be replaced. Uh, I mean, I, I I agree. I mean, I've I've got a, another podcast actually tomorrow with somebody who's um who who writes papers about education reform and our attitude towards creativity and the and the arts in education and how there's. I mean, and I've said it before on the podcast. I think there's like false market incentives that kind of show people that well. We, the only thing you need is money. Again, this is kind of what we were talking about earlier. And so the, the sciences are all the things that can provide you a job and then you'll have an income and then you'll have money and then you'll be happy and that's all you need. And I actually think those are those things are all crucial, but it's only one half of a very difficult equation at the very most. And the other half is that you need the arts because studying the arts just makes better people. Like It's, it's a very simple thing. Like the heavier the push towards the sem- the STEM subjects at the expense of the arts, for me, I think it's the higher the likelihood of poor mental health, of uh, a, a kind of crisis of meaning for a lot of people, suicide rates going up. These are all things that happen now, and I'm not, I'm not saying that the single cause is that people don't study the arts, but I think if you diminish the arts and you say that that's not useful and it's not important and you shouldn't do it because it adds nothing of value, you're, you're probably a fool. You're probably a fool and you're probably not very happy. Well, going back to the ballerina advert, I saw a version of it that said, like, so they're basically saying the arts are pointless and it was like um, a mind map of it kind of thing. So it was pointing like this photo was taken by a photographer. This was this writing was written by a copywriter. This advert was done by someone who does, like, marketing. Like, it just went through the whole, like, everyone who would have been a part of making that is in the arts. Like, it's not rocket science. People, like, to make anything marketing-wise, even, like, anything to do with the, with the government doing a billboard or whatever, that's 
are doing a video, cameramen, sound guys. They've all studied an art degree to a, to a set, like in a sense, but then their services are made out like they're not important. Yeah, I think it's just. I mean, for me, I I, I don't really know where that originated, but I I know that the advice largely comes from the economic advisor for the government. And if it's coming from somebody who's an economicist, then that advice makes sense because they're right. You shouldn't work in the arts if you want money. And that's what somebody who studies econ- economics cares about. So the advice is is good, but largely I just think that belies a more important question about what makes better people. And I think you want a balance of those two things. I mean, for me, the easiest way to solve that is to make money obsolete. Uh, not obsolete, but less important. Like if everybody feels imperiled because they don't have a steady income, then, I mean, there's this thing of universal, universal basic income, isn't there? I don't know if you've heard much about that, but giving everybody just a, a wage, not necessarily a huge one, but enough to provide uh, some income on a regular basis for nothing and everybody gets it. And I think that would have a positive effect on people's health and people balancing themselves out and studying the arts because they want to do it and not having the kind of this looming spectre of money woes hovering over them all of the time. Because I think that's the thing that sets people off on the wrong course is like, well, I've got to make money. How do I do that? And it just, it's one, it's one iteration to the next of making things progressively worse for yourself by chasing money, 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 money. And before you know it, you've gone off course, all you're getting is money, but you're miserable. Yeah. This is one of the things that I was saying before that it, that holds you back. Like I was getting the money and had the time to pursue something that I was really interested in. But then as soon as that, that money stops, that's when you have to be thinking, oh no, I need to do something about it. And like, even at uni, like I, I, I really wanted to do my degree. I knew I weren't going to have much money, but I still managed to do it. I think you just live within your means. You don't really, like you realise what you can live without. Like, for me, it was like, I'm not going to buy makeup. I'm not going to go shopping. I'm just going to buy food. That's it. That's all I need. It's hard with wealth as well, because it's all relative. And because it's so easy to see people who are incredibly wealthy, because we've got social media, we all compare ourselves to those people rather than what we should compare, if anything, to, which is the people immediately surrounding us, who probably have similar a similar degree of wealth or, or lack of thereof. But we kind of... Yeah, I almost think we confuse ourselves by staring at people with driving around in Ferraris on Instagram in big mansion houses and thinking that, oh, well, that's what I'm supposed... I wish I should be able to have that then. You know, almost all of these things, though, just put people in a in a, like a scarcity mindset. And when you're in this scarcity mindset, you, you don't think straight. You're more emotional because you're kind of, it's kind of triggering all of these fear responses. And so instead of doing sensible things, you start doing erroneous things and... You do things that you wouldn't you wouldn't recommend any of your friends do if they asked, but you do them anyway because you're so terrified that you don't have a steady income. I mean, we've all done it. We've all done it. I my one of my criticisms of how the government are handling the lockdown and the the pandemic at the moment really is that they're they're not doing anything bold and brave, which is what they need to do, because they're just trying to do these tiny small gestures. And it's not enough. Like I think you need to do something really well, courageous, which would alienate some people and piss a lot of people off, but it would work. So what am I not? I, I don't know what that thing is. <laughs> the thing is that it's face criticism no matter what they do. So they may as well do something worthwhile. Yeah, I, I, if this is just my, my outlook on things, is that if I feel backed into a corner, if I have a scarcity mindset, I know, I recognise that. And usually for me, that's a... That's the time to attack. And so I do. I, I, I attack almost. And so, that, I mean, you're aware of, of my personal circumstances that I can't really publicly speak about at the moment. But I mean, maybe by the time this podcast airs, I'll, that will be different. But there are things going on in my personal life now that are evidence of that. Like I feel, I feel almost backed into a corner because of the the wages I'm likely to expect when I return to work. And it's not satisfying enough. It's not good enough. But everybody's in that same kind of 
mindset. Everybody feels imperiled by the way the world is right now. And so for me, that that is an opportunity. That is an alarm bell for me to attack. Like, okay, I have to do something brave here and I have to take some risks because nobody else is going to. But again, that's just me. And that's what I was saying before about having a survival mode. Like, you've gone into survival mode because your brain's working, thinking, how can I get out of this? How can I look after my situation and get get out of it? But it's hard, but it's hard as well because there are two survival modes. And one of them is this instinctive survival mode where you just kind of go into this, like, it's instinctive. It's almost like like animalistic, instinctive. It's just emotive. And that's more like a, that is more of like a fearful response to it. But it's dwelling in the emotion of that fear. And what I, I'm I'm not the most in touch with my emotions and the best of days anyway, but I, I can, I see those emotions and I have the same responses and I go, this is a bit scary. This is, I genuinely, genuinely don't know what I'm going to do. But then I quickly, in the same way that I don't swim around in a circle, I quickly go, hang on, no, no, this is not, this is not good enough. I've got to go somewhere else here. And so I'll, I'm quite quick to do that but again i'm i'm not trying to big myself up because i don't think it's anything that anybody else couldn't do it's just a skill that i've just spent a lot of time learning i i mainly when i speak about stuff like this if it's because i want other people to do it like i wish other people wouldn't back themselves into corners and feel like oh, i've just got to do the safe thing it's like i think actually the safe thing sometimes is the thing that feels not safe i do think i've had this I don't think I'm so bad at it. I am quite good at making decisions that I know is, like, I've had enough, this is the right thing to do, I need to get out now. I'm not going to waste time dwelling on it. But, like, I've got friends who'd be in a job that they hate and they'll come to me and tell me the same problem over and over again. This keeps happening, this is happening. And I'm like, why are you telling me again? The fact you're telling me again shows you've not done anything about it. Like, you need to take yourself... If you're not happy, which you're clearly not, you take yourself out of that situation, and it's not that hard. <laughs> How easy is it to follow that advice as well, though? Because I find that really hard. I can give advice, but I can't always follow it too well. Yeah, obviously, you... From the outside in is a lot of a lot easier, but you're planting that seed in someone's head so that one day they will snap and be like, yeah, that, you're right. But it does take more time with some than others. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, like for you, I I can say things to you like I'm I'm not you, so I don't have the emotions that you might feel about what you're doing today or tomorrow, whatever it is. So I can give advice completely dispassionately, mm-hmm. and you could do the same for me. But that same advice may be good or bad, but I would find it if I was giving it, I would still find it difficult for me to follow my own advice. I mean, that's an Alice in Wonderland quote, isn't it? I, f- I forget what it is. It's like, she seldom follows her own advice. No, I think I definitely... Because even, like, with recent situations I've been in, people have been like, Jess, you know you'd tell me this if it was me. And I'm like, yeah, I would, actually. And then that, that sort of makes you... It, it does get in your mind and makes you think about it differently. I am... I'm not like a forceful advice giver. I'm not like, how dare you? You must change your ways. I'm like, it's after a while when I'm hearing the same thing over and over again. I lose a bit of patience with it. And I'm just like, you need to stop this. This isn't, you're not listening to anything I'm saying. And I know my advice is quite good. <laughs> yeah, I I just know from like my, my experiences there is if somebody gives me, I could have give the same advice to 20 people. But as soon as I find myself in that same position, I... It's almost like I've never heard that advice. I don't know what it is because I'm too busy feeling my way through it and just like I feel cloudy almost. But it's uh, I think that's just a fairly common, (laughs) fairly common problem that people tend to have. This has turned into like quite a deep conversation about mental well-being and the role of work, I think. (laughs) I didn't expect it, though. I didn't expect it. I'm very raw at the moment in the sense of like, literally go back to work on Monday after not working for seven months, Darren. Seven months. It's so long. Same. And like, I was just like, everyone was very understanding. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to take a while to settle into this because I'm getting up early. I can't go lay on my sofa when I want. Although I'm back working at home now, so I am. (laughs) But it's just a very tiring, off-kilter experience 
when you're so used to being at home and pleasing yourself. Well, and it take it'll take any of these things. I think it's a bit of a learning curve, and it'll just you get, when you're in touch with yourself a little bit more, you'll be able to tell whether it's like the right thing to do A or B, whatever those things are. Like if when I go back to work, I'm sure it'll be the same sort of thing. Like my instinct right now is that going back is a mistake and I don't want to do it and it's the wrong thing for me. But then on the other hand, it needs must. Yeah, that's what I so, mean. Your priorities have changed over the past few months. That's the thing. And then when you're brought back into this sort of reality you questioning it all the time but then because i'm in such a new position like a completely new place a completely new job it's not as a like overwhelming as like just go back to the same job because i didn't want to do that i would have i think i sent messages to the universe telling them not to let me go back there because i didn't want to so much um well no one's going back to the same job in a way no it's all or very few people (laughs) I know I'm not, but I mean, okay, let's, let's leave it there. That's uh, an hour and a half, believe it or not. Oh, we did all right, didn't we? We did all right. Um, Where can people find your work, the things you're doing? So I am on Instagram at jess.bakes.vegan and I'm on Instagram facebook as well for those more facebook inclined under for the older generation usually my generation you're not that much older <laughs> uh, so that's just at jess bakes vegan um i am more i'm better at instagram i find it, facebook honestly confuses me i don't it just doesn't feel very user friendly so yeah no same. instagram stories keep everyone up to date with my great vegan discoveries and my bakes it's all on there nice well keep baking i will you keep teeing (laughs) never heard that as a verb before but i will you can have that (laughs) thank you very much 